Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to part two of our interview with Professor Roy Baumeister. Hello again. So Professor Baumeister was in the smart stream <laughs> in school. So he is a high IQ guy. So Professor Baumeister, some years ago you wrote a controversial book. The book was about men. Why are men important? Are we sacrificing men? Oh, well, uh, in our society, I'd say it's pretty clear the focus has been on women uh, for quite a while. And uh, so there's a great concern from top to bottom to do things to benefit women and girls and so on. And there's much less concern with the uh, uh, the welfare of boys and men. And uh, by all accounts, boys and men are doing uh, are doing worse uh, on a lot of dimensions Uh whether it's uh, graduating from college or being healthy or even living. I mean, women live longer than men. Uh, somebody just pointed out recently the United the United Nations has six different agencies concerned with women's health <laughs> and none with men's health, uh, even though in pretty much every country in the world, men die younger than women. So I think that that is a pretty clear sign of the global priority uh, that, uh, that that we care about men. Now that we care about women uh, much more than men. I saw an article in a British publication some time ago saying that boys are more exposed to modern slavery than girls. And it was in a UK publication. Um, I don't know. I saw that recently. And I was shocked because when we think about human trafficking and modern slavery, we, we really think about boys. We think about girls. Yeah, especially if if it's counting sex trafficking, there's more demand for uh, uh, female sex workers than male sex workers. Um, but uh, I don't know what the boys are being uh, trafficked for. I, I haven't really kept up with the uh, modern slavery. A lot of it's in the Middle East, right? Is, is that where it's happening? Uh, well, I obviously, you're not going to be aware because boys are not girls. <laughs> If we were talking about girls, you would have been aware. Yes, that's true. We would have, we would have heard of it. Uh, yeah, I remember that Boko Haram uh, yes. was a big outcry when they attacked a girls' school and kidnapped a bunch of the girls. But sort of a couple of weeks before that, they'd attacked a boys' school and burned it to the ground and killed all the boys. And uh, I didn't know that. I didn't know. I, I, maybe I don't remember, but I didn't follow that. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, you know, some people pointed out that uh, oh, everyone's concerned about girls, but uh, who you know most of them. I mean, it wasn't a nice experience by any means, but uh, uh, most of them survived and eventually found their way back home. Uh, whereas uh, the boys would just be killed, and no one, no one said anything. And why do you think boys are failing in school? Is it because teachers have lower standards for boys, and they actually do across the world, not just in the West, but even in the non-European West, like in the Caribbean, that's a fact. They do have lower standards for boys. Okay, I uh, I don't know much about that. Uh, um, there are studies suggesting that teachers will give a lower mark for an identical essay if they think it's written by a boy. It will get a lower mark than a girl. So there's some some prejudice there, but I doubt that that's the main explanation. Uh, and indeed, boys probably as a, boys generally do worse in school, um, for for multiple reasons, and so that you know, many stereotypes are based on reality. Uh, so for the teacher to expect that, yes, it's unfair to the specific boy. But the the bigger things, uh, for one thing, boys grow up more slowly than girls. Yeah. Um, so I've heard people say, which strikes me as quite reasonable they should start school maybe six months later uh, or a year later yeah, even. Um, that would give the boy a little more time to grow up. Uh, so it would be fairer in, in that sense. It would also uh, um, mimic the, the social life that people have. Usually when people date and marry and so on, the, the male is, is a little older than the female. Uh, and so it would be nice for the kids if their their school classes were made up that way either because that's where many of the first uh, romantic uh, things start um so that would be one accommodation um 
I, I've, I've heard other things, which I, I don't know quite as much how to evaluate. Uh, we, we had a daughter and uh, uh, we sent her to a nice private school. And my mother, uh, my, mother my, my wife, my daughter's <laughs> mother, uh, went to uh, a, a lot of the meetings uh, and, and saw how things operate. And, and her impression, of course, we were happy to have <laughs> things done favorably for girls because uh, we had a girl. Uh, but, uh, but my wife's impression was that, well, first of all, all the decision makers are women, you know, there are hardly fewer and fewer men left in teaching and administrative positions in, 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 in schools. And she said, well, each time there's a decision to make, they have to decide they want to treat everybody the same because of equality. Uh, so we have to do, uh, the same thing for boys and girls and well, some things are better you could do it the way that's better for boys or the way it's better for girls. Uh, and she said every time they'd have a discussion, they would talk about it seriously and they'd realize the, the trade-off. But uh, to do it, what would be better for boys would just seem sexist to them. <laughs> and so over and over, each little decision was made without any grand plan or anything, just to shape school to be more uh, designed for girls. And so it becomes a, a, a difficult uh, environment. Uh, for boys, uh, you can mold girls with, uh, you know, with guilt and they can sit still and pay attention. You have to be stricter with the boys and offer uh, livelier information and different kinds of things. But all the things that, that, that engage the boys were being phased out in favor of stuff to orient more toward toward the girls. And then there starts to have the youth culture that the boys think school is something something for girls. My my colleague uh, John Tierney, who I, I wrote the Willpower book yeah. with, he talked. Uh, he went to uh, South America uh, when he was a boy. His parents, uh, so I guess his father was a professor, and they had a sabbatical. And uh, I believe he was in, uh, in in Chile, and he said he was there. And they sent him to a boys' school, and it was a, such a change uh, from the co-ed junior high school where he'd been back in the U.S. And he said, first of all, it was such a relief because there weren't all the social games and difficulties because the boys aren't you know, complicated in their social lives as girls are. And it, it didn't matter what you looked like. Everybody just dressed like a bum. Uh, and he said that the key thing is every class was 50 minutes and then there was 10 minutes of soccer. At the end of every class, <laughs> all the boys would go outside and kick around the soccer ball for 10 minutes. And this is a great way to manage a boy. But, you know, you don't need to do that kind of thing with girls. But you can get some of their energy off and uh, uh, keep them, uh, you know, makes it easier for them to sit still for the next hour. Uh, and, uh, and so there are things we can do to make schools more hospitable to boys. But when it's run by women trying to look out for what's best for girls, those considerations maybe get dropped. And again, I don't have systematic data on this. These are these are impressions. The fact is, you're right that the boys are doing worse in school uh, at pretty much every level at, at present. I don't think um, that was true back when I was in school. Um, some some people posit that the nature of the modern education system favors girls because it is predicated on assignment on assignments and coursework etc whereas boys will do well with one exam so we give a boy one exam and he will get an a b c or and move on yes girls need, con they, girls need constant preparation preparation there's a study saying that women do better in college because they are more conscientious. So colleges today are not really based on natural brilliance or getting straight A's. You follow the assignments and the rules. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, I was talking to a professor yesterday who was saying he had a complaint from a student who, you know, he gave him a B. He said, well, why didn't I get an A? He said, you said we got to write a paper on this, and I did it. He said, you have to touch on these five themes, and I touched on them, all of them. I did everything you you, you assigned, so I should get an A. And the professor said, yeah, but you didn't do it very well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they thought, oh, it should be just uh, checking, off, checking off the boxes. Yeah. Um, anyway, yes, uh, I, uh, I don't know whether people like to... Uh, say this or, or not or whatever but uh, women are more conscientious they're better at 
doing what they're told, following instructions and, and so on. I noticed when I ran the graduate program at, at Florida State that uh, in general, it seemed the, uh, the the women students were better at getting it done on time and uh, uh, get, meeting the deadlines and uh, moving along through uh, through smoothly through the, the whole path. Um, they were, I don't have a lot of numbers on this, but uh, it, they were less likely to go out and make the real dramatic splash afterwards. Um, although, although some of them certainly have, have done so. Uh, but it goes with following the rules and, and being safe, whereas the, the, the boys are, you know, men men are more different from each other than women are. This is uh, this is true at the biological level. I'm, I'm most familiar with it from the intelligence literature, uh, where it's it's very true. The president of Harvard, there, Larry Summers, got yes, he lost his job for saying. I it, like but, Larry, <laughs> but he was complete, but he was completely right about. Uh, uh, yes, there are more men at the uh, the top level. Uh, there are also more men at the bottom level. And uh, I had colleagues who studied mental retardation, yeah. and as you go from the mildly retarded to the moderately to the severely, the preponderance of boys gets bigger and uh, and bigger. Uh, my, I've known some biologists who said it's not just intelligence; it's true on a lot of traits. Men are a lot more uh, different, even on things like height. I mean, there is an average difference on height. Men are taller. But uh, they're more extremely short and extremely tall men than uh, than uh, than women, um, and so uh, I forget how, why we got onto this. But uh, um, we're talking about male differences. So originally, the discussion the discussion was centered oh, yes, on yes, yes, okay. differences, and then um, led to male differences. But yeah. back to your point about the greater male variability hypothesis. That finding was replicated again, maybe last year or early this year, in an evolutionary psychology journal. Okay, good. Yeah, no, I'm I'm pretty sure it's true. I've seen. I, I don't have this in my own data. I don't look at that sort of thing. But I've seen multiple studies come. Uh, and come luckily for me, Richard Lynn, before he died, gave me his book for free. Oh, okay. So Richard Lynn is the originator of this thesis. Richard Lynn and Elmut Nyborg, those people. But yeah, so Richard Lynn gave me his free book before he died last year. <laughs> okay, I, I heard about the book and heard that it's quite good. I haven't I haven't seen it myself. Yeah, like I, I'm a Richard Lynn fan. He had a lot of critics in academia, but I am a Richard Lynn fan. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, so his findings were actually replicated by Rinderman and Becker. So before you discredit an academic, you, you must always do your research. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, it's just like women in science. I've This is the second study I've seen this year. It was in the European Social Social Review saying that the, there is a paucity of women in science because they are not as interested in science as men and they have different prefer preferences, end of story. That's why yeah. they're not doing science, nothing else. Yes, yes. Yeah, this idea that there are barriers or discrimination is, is mostly made up. Um, and it's always men must change. I even notice all the writings about gender. Um, well, if there's a problem, especially a problem of women, then men have to change. Uh, <laughs> it's it's yeah. never women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, in fact, uh, awesome. I knew Tubi and Cosmetas, who are two great evolutionary yeah. psychologists, a married couple, uh, and I, I talked to them and they were interested in a lot of things. But the woman said, uh, I, yeah, I stop at after biology. I'm not interested in physics and the, the stuff. Mm -hmm. She called it the dead world. And <laughs> she left the dead world to her husband. Uh, so she only got interested if it, if it involved living things. And uh, uh, and for women in general, interested in, in, in people um more than in mastering the world which is kind of how our, our species evolved and how our civilization evolved that uh, the men worked out how to master the in the physical environment and how to uh, build things and preserve things and grow things and all that uh, and the women concentrated more on the interpersonal relationships and that's why even though some boys do worse in school men still start bigger businesses more innovative businesses than the best publishers are men. The men publish the right. hottest books. J.K. Rowling, she's an exception. But men write more books than women, where books are reviewed more, etc. So there's still an achievement in Japan. I think it's because of what you 
referred to earlier, navigating the world. So in the real world, it's not enough for it to be conscientious. Sometimes they have to understand the rules to break them. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, no, it's it's pretty clear. Innovation comes much more uh, from men and, and, and men collectively. Women collectively, there's a surprising lack of, of progress. Yeah, like I wrote a paper on the topic recently, last year in, in the Magdis, on the Magdis blog, and I was saying that probably we are wasting billions of dollars in capital by financing women in STEM and entrepreneurship. Because despite spending billions, we have not been reaping the fruits. Right. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're not really re reaping the fruits, neither in entrepreneurship or even in the upper level of academia. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's true. The top achievers, the most productive people tend to be men. So what about your examples as a professor, your students? Are your best students male, female? I've had uh, plenty of both. Uh, I, I think I counted among my PhDs and postdocs slightly more women than men. Uh, I always wanted to uh, to have both. Um, and uh, when I look at the top performers, there are, there are some of both there. So I've been blessed to have talented people both men and women and uh um i don't you know, i don't have a preference in general yeah no no that's that's the issue most people really don't have a preference most people are actually more willing to tell females rather than males yeah well when i was in graduate school and starting out most professors seemed to specialize the most of the professors were men and some of them worked pretty much only with men and a few of them worked only with women um and I tried to study them both because I knew I wanted to work with both. <laughs> uh, but it's sort of a different style. The, the ones who worked with men were always uh, being strict and putting down and, uh, you know, deflating your bubble. Whereas the ones who worked with women were very supportive and, oh, you're doing great and encouraging it. I, I, I recall one of, my, one of my guys, a PhD student, when he finished, I usually have sort of an exit interview and give him some advice to get started in the career. And he said, well, what about mentoring male and female graduate students? And I said, well, uh, he, he reminded me of this conversation years later. I'd, I'd forgotten it. And apparently I'd said, well, you know, everyone's different. But on average, with the men, you have to bring them down to earth and puncture their egotism <laughs> and uh, put a, lay down the law to them. And with the women, you got to encourage them and, 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 and uh, so soothe any insecurity and stuff like that. And he said, you heard me say that. He said, okay, Roy's a nice guy, but he's obviously old and some outmoded sexist ideas. <laughs> anyway, he came back and told me this five years later. He said, I've tried everything. <laughs> and, <laughs> and what I had told him was the only thing that really worked. Uh, so he had come around, to, to, which is how I got to it too. It's just uh, uh, in practice that uh, you need to encourage and, and support and, and, and reward the uh, women and you got to deflate the men and uh, uh, get serious and, and, and work hard. Would you, well, maybe you did already in the past, but would you start a new career in management consulting? Would I start a new career? In management consulting. Um, I think it's awfully hard to get started in that, isn't it? No, I mean, you have you have the expertise. You're a famous professor. <laughs> yeah, but it takes more than that. You have to get people to hire you and and things. <laughs> and uh, um, I you know it might be interesting, be fun to do. I'm, I'm I retired from my university when it ran into money problems. I didn't want to be there anymore. Um, but uh, um, I could do it, but. I don't know. I'm I'm old to be starting a new career. <laughs> uh, still, uh, if, if somebody wanted me, I'd be glad to do it. Yeah. Well, there are some people who argue that we need to increase the retirement age <laughs> because we're getting older. <laughs> well, that that's true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was. I think the first old age pension was Bismarck in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it was. It only started at 65 or something when most people died in their 50s. Uh, and uh, um, the U.S. one was set up in the same way. Uh, 
It had started at the age past what the average age of death was. But now people are living to into their 90s. My parents both just died at, at age 94. And uh, they retired in their 50s. Uh, oh, wow. so they had uh, almost 40 years of, uh, uh, of retirement life. Uh, and that's a lot for society to uh, to support uh, when they're, they're not being productive. Um, people are healthier and smarter and living longer uh, than they were. Uh, so you're more capable of continuing to work uh, than you were. And so, yeah, I think uh, that would be a sensible policy change to uh, raise the retirement age. Uh, I know the French just tried to do it and they had yes. they, they <laughs> Yeah, they chaos. <laughs> the, the French love to, to riot. Yes, they do. Yeah, they 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 they, they love to riot. But where where are you now? Are you living in the states? Yes, I'm in Utah at present. My wife is a professor at Brigham Young University, so we're we're living here. Um, I move around some. Last fall, I was at Harvard, uh, taught a seminar there. It was kind of fun. Um. In May, I'll go to Europe for a couple of months, or I'm a visiting scholar at the, the small university over there. Um, so I get around some, but yes, my main home is here, here in Utah, up in the mountains. And were you in Australia? I was there for several years. Yes, yeah, that was yeah. the last one I retired from. That I really liked that. That was a nice job. But uh, uh, when COVID happened, they shut down and and they relied heavily on foreign students. Half their student body was foreign students who paid a higher tuition rate and so suddenly they couldn't come because australia shut down very tight and so the university just went into huge financial crisis so somewhat sadly i uh, I, I left australia yeah i have met a few australians i in one of my pieces i note that australia is successful because of the type of anti-social people who were sent there many of the Criminals who went to Australia were financial criminals, so they could be integrated into the entrepreneurial system. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, there is certain prestige there if you're you can trace your descent back to the uh, the convicts who who were sent there. It uh, um, it, would, it was an interesting genetic uh, experiment, but uh, now they're still getting lots of immigration and. Uh, um, so I, I don't know what it means about the gene pool and, um, there is this attitude, which you could say echoes, uh, some of the, the criminal mindset that, uh, that, uh, well, we can break some of the rules and, uh, um, um, I don't know, misbehave more in a, they, they're of... stellar on entrepreneurs are stellar on people. <laughs> are, are what? Risk tolerant, criminal risk, risk tolerant, tolerant yes. like oh, yes, entrepreneurs. Yes. yes, yes, that's probably why males do it more than females too, because <laughs> the uh, tolerance for risk is much greater in the males. You see, males doing all sorts of crazy things that uh, women would have too much sense not to do. Uh, but it also goes with uh, taking on risks like that, uh, which uh, uh, sometimes lead to great success and sometimes to huge failure. Um, to the woman, that's not worth it. So, Roy, you have a new book out. What's the name of your new book? A uh, new book will be The Science of Free Will. It's going to be out in September of 2024, this year. Oh. Um, what, did you write a book last year? Uh, let's see. Last year, I had The Self-Explained. Okay. Maybe okay. that was 22. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and what, what are your findings on free will? Oh, well, that will take a while to go through. Uh, but uh, um, the thing is, r r the way I talk about it briefly is I've talked to a lot of scientists who believe in free will and a lot who don't. And I mostly agree with both sides because they're not talking about the same thing. Uh, the ones who are against it think it means, you know, you have a soul that causes behavior independent of physical processes. I don't believe in that or that somehow causality is turned off and you're unaffected by anything in the environment. I don't, I don't believe in that either. Uh, in contrast, the ones who do believe in it, it's uh, flexible behavior, being able to override an impulse, being able to uh, uh, act differently in the same situation to make rational decisions. Um, uh, how behavior happens, you know, the brain sends, sends signals to move the muscles. 
Okay, and so prior to that, whatever we would call free will is, is something that happens there, but there's clearly a system of that controls behavior that tells the brain how it should should tell the muscles to move. And the remarkable thing is that the scientists who believe in free will and the ones who don't, they all agree that the human system is is different from any other animals, much far advanced, can do all sorts of things that other animals can't, like projecting into the future or uh, invoking moral principles or economic trade, things like that. Uh, so to me, that's the scientific problem. Let's understand this new innovation in the human mind. It's far different from the other great apes. Uh, let's understand that. And arguing about whether it should be called free will. I mean, I think it's close enough. And it isn't the ideal term if we were just... <clears throat> If we were just discovering it today, we probably wouldn't name it free will. But given that the term has been used for centuries, mm -hmm. it's close enough. And and for me, the free part is not not really a problem. The will part is the more obscure because we, we don't really have a psychology of will. You can pick up an intro to psychology textbook. There's no chapter on the will. Uh, but that, that, that some, <laughs> some actions are freer than others. This seems to be quite legitimate to me. That's because psychologists might not be interested in the medieval philosophers so they don't care about the will <laughs> right yes yeah well william james did talk about the will i'm reading his textbook 1890 so it's like a, a century and a quarter old um even a little more a century and a third um so he talked about it but it uh, it hasn't held up it's been a long time since there's a psychology of will so the will part is a metaphor the free, I think, is, is legitimate enough. Uh, some actions are freer than others. And uh, that's all we need. Okay, so we're wrapping up. But last question before I go. Ego depletion, that's the most replicated finding in psychology. Oh, I wouldn't say in all of psychology. Uh, in social psychology, uh, there was a a big study that said they didn't find it, that they failed to replicate it. And so that got a lot of publicity uh, but they did it wrong, and then somebody else did another one, and then it replicated fine, even in the huge multi-laboratory system. And there's something like seven or 800 published uh, findings, all consistent with the uh, original. And sometimes there are, there are a few others of null. There's, there's none in the opposite direction. So it's not just, you know, you're lucky capitalizing on random fluctuations. Um, there are real-world applications. There are pre-registration is a new thing in science that uh, you have to say in advance how you're going to do the study and what analysis you're going to do and what you predict and so on. There are pre-registered studies that, uh, that that have worked just fine. So it it checks all the boxes. Uh, social psychology things in general, the replication isn't as strong in in some areas. I would think sort of a basic animal learning reinforcement punishment those would replicate very strongly uh indeed stronger and then some of the basic sort of just cognitive thinking effects uh, uh those tend to travel better and you can get those more easily and different like people remember the th in a list of words they'll remember the first few and the last few better than the ones in the middle um that's going to replicate really well uh, but in terms of social psychology, where you have live interactions and complicated judgments and things like that, uh, ego depletion is uh, is certainly one of the, the handful of, of, of most replicated findings. And remind our listeners, what is ego depletion again? Oh, okay, good. Uh, so that was, that was uh, what started the willpower uh, idea that, that, that there's uh, some energy used for self-control. Uh, so what we found in the early studies is that after people exert self-control, if there's another demand for self-control, presumably a different one that comes along right afterward, they do worse at the first, or they do worse at the second task uh, as compared to people who skipped the first task. Uh, so it suggests they used up some of their willpower on the first task and didn't have enough to do the second properly. So they, they skimp on that. Um, and so there are lots of different procedures. We have people... Uh, resist the temptation to eat chocolate and you know that depletes them uh, or they have to watch a funny movie without laughing and you keep a straight face or watch a really sad or disgusting movie without showing anything in their face to control their feelings uh, or uh, 
a variety of other things. And then you can measure how long they can hold their hand in ice water uh, or how long they keep trying at a difficult task before they give up, um, all, all sorts of other things. So the depletion is the effect that there seems to be limited energy uh, that uh, after one self-control task, people do worse on the other. And that's extended now. It also applies to decision-making and planning and uh, taking initiative to be active instead of passive. All right. Brilliant conversation as usual. What I, This is what I expect from a scholar of your caliber. Do you know, so Jeffrey Williamson was the head of the economics department of, at Harvard, and I interviewed him some time ago. He's in his 80s, and he was super brilliant. He, he could recall his studies quite efficiently. He could recall the findings. And I no, appreciate that. Yeah, yes, he, yes, yes. Yeah, he did but, some really good research back, back in his day. Yeah. Yeah. But again, thanks for coming on. All right. Well, thanks for having me. It was a great, uh, great conversation. And I'll send you those emails with the the Jared Rubin study. And okay. And the Murdoch response. All right. Bye. All right. Bye.